F Doom, Zev Luff X, History Lesson. Special guests include Pete Nice, Ernie Panicoli, and more. Appreciate everybody joining me on this Saturday. Hope everybody's doing good today. Appreciate you making it. Hey, yo. If you guys got any questions at any time, uh, be sure to leave them in the comments. Yeah, I would definitely post it on uh, YouTube, third side. Yes, sir. R.I.P. Doom. Got some good uh, guests today. We're going to get into some deep, deep history uh, uh, and go way back. Get Yours Posse is in the building. If you know, you know. Sir, what's up, Summer? Yeah. Action Slaxon. What's going on? What's up, How you feeling? Yo, what's up? How you feeling? I'm good, man. I'm very good. How are you feeling today? Yo, just, you know, still a little, you know, just in amazement over the out, outpouring of love for Doom. Yeah. But also, you know, still hit, you know, just by the reality that he passed, you know, which was so unexpected. Absolutely. Well, let me get you a, a, a proper introduction. Uh, but before I do that, um, a lot of people think uh, today is Doom's birthday. Why do you think that is? Uh, and uh, why do we celebrate January the 9th? Is there any uh, thoughts behind that? Um, I, I mean, I just know, like, when I, when I saw the date, someone told me yesterday, and then I saw all these posts, and I was like, I always thought Doom was, his birthday was in the summer. Because uh, my pops was born in July, and it was, like, right around the same time. And then, like, I just asked a couple of friends, like, hey, what what was Doom's actual birthday? And, like, a couple of people sent me a couple of docs that showed his real birthday is July 19th, 71. Right. And, uh, you know, like, hey, let him have two birthdays. You know what I'm saying? It's it's, it's all good. But I, but I know Wikipedia is always fucked up, so right. they can't get anything. So I, it doesn't surprise me that. You know, they list, listed his actual birthday as something that was, you know, <laughs> right. not a fact. Uh, a lot of people... I mean... Go ahead. I, I, there's so many things, like, on the third page on my page that are incorrect. Like, even they, they couldn't even get, like, where I was born, you know? Like, I even... And I, I kind of said, I wasn't born here. I, I could show you my birth certificate. It's right here. I sent my birth certificate. They're like, well, you have to go... Th I'm like, I'm the person that the page is about. I'm telling you that this is my birth certificate. <laughs> I guess you're not too interested in the truth or facts, you know? Right. Uh, a lot of people seem to think Doom's uh, started uh, his origin as Doom. Uh, I thought that it would be great to go back and get some uh, earlier pieces in his history, you guys like yourself, um, to get a full understanding, basically, uh, of how Doom came and uh, who he is today. Um, any thoughts on that? And with that being said, uh, go ahead and kick him in the grill, Pete. All right, man. So fr from what I knew and a lot of first person from Doom and some from other his friends over the years, Doom was born in England. And at some point, his family came over. And I think they lived in Manhattan. Actually, I think they lived on a couple of blocks that Dante was familiar with where he lived when he was a kid. And then at some point, and maybe near like middle school or early freshman year in high school, they moved out to Long Beach, Long Island. So 
I was living in uh, Long Island, Florida Park for a while, while I was in, you know, junior high school. And I went to high school in Brooklyn, but still lived in Long Island. And Serge was living in Far Rockaway. And, you know, LB is very close. So he started hanging out, I believe, with the Med Notice, our two dan original dancers, even before we were third base. And he was introduced to Doom and Sub, I believe, by Ahmed, I think. And they would go to some of these talent shows that were at the MLK Center in Long Beach. That's like, you know, Serge MLK Center almost go to bed one when he tried to enter. So Spectrum City, like, you know, Chuck D, Flavor Flav were, and even Dr. Dre, Operating Room, Wild Man Steve, they had the big radio show out there for Long Island. So Long Island had a long mm -hmm. tradition of hip hop history with, you know, even Africa Bambada, Jazzy J, and then would come out the different spots out in Long Island. Even Biz, very early on, was doing shows with Mike and Dave out in Shirley, Long Island, other places, because Biz stayed in, in Long Island for a bit. So there was a hip-hop history in Long Island. So when you get out to Long Beach, Doom is living in Long Beach, they're going to these talent shows. And that's where, you know, Search kind of met Doom, I believe, and then started hanging out and kicking with them, and just with that whole crew, GYP in Long Beach. And... You know, Onyx has said that he, I think he lived a block away from Doom, said that Doom and him were kind of like outcasts because they were new in town, they dressed different, were kind of like, you know, had a creative artistic side, were always like drawing, doing graffiti, skateboarding. And I think that they met, you know, when a dog ran after, uh, I just heard this the other day when Onyx said that a dog, like a stray dog ran after him and he ran into Doom's crib and... <laughs> You know, put his hand through the window or whatever. So that's how they started in Long Beach. And, you know, they were doing their thing. And when I, when Search first told me and when I met Doom, they had a, a tape that they were working on as KMD or an earlier, you know, formation of it with this guy. I think it was Jade One was the third member. I had always forgot his name, but I actually looked at the paperwork and uh, remember it was Jade One. And, you know, Maybe it was like partial pause tape, partial, you know, very, you know, early drum machine type shit that, you know, they would do, you know, music wherever they could. And, you know, shit was, shit was, was dope for, especially for some young kids. And, you know, Subrock was so young. He was like, so in the, in, in the background at that point, Doom was like the presence and kind of like the representative. Plus he was, you know, the MC of the group. So, you know, one thing led to another and, you know, Search had been hanging out with them for, for quite a bit. And then when we got together, we would go out to Long Beach. If you look at some of those pictures on the back of the Cactus album, those are pictures in the basement of our dancer Ahmed in his, in his basement. Thank God for his mother letting us do some of these things that we did. She opened up the crib for us to do this whole photo shoot with this famous photographer. And it was crazy in there. But, you know, so that was one of our spots as, you know, me and Serge, third base, you know, just this bond between GYP. And then, like, you know, we just put put them on with us. And we, you know, and then put Doom on the gas face because the gas face was actually a term that was used by the GYP. And as far as I knew the, the origins, even though I say Zev Lover gave it the first light, he gave it to me and Serge, but... I think Search had said that it was Subrock who came up with it. It was actually another kid in GYP who actually came up with that when they were going out to the Roosevelt Field Mall. And it was it happened on a bus, you know, on the way back. And me and Serge, you know, weren't anywhere near when it happened. But we we heard the term, like, yo, you gas and, you know, give him the gas face. And Prince Paul had sent me a cassette when we wanted him to do a couple of joints for us, because we had the bomb squad doing two. And then we had Sam Sever doing all the rest with us. So we, you know, we were dying to do something with Paul. So he hit me off with a cassette, played it for Surge. And at some point we would do them and we we're like, yo, we're going to, we picked out the Brooklyn Queens and the gas face beat. And he said, yo, come on out to the studio at Island media, I guess center each, you know, strong Island. And, we, we were all, I think, I think we might have uh, met at, at Jamaica Station with Doom and them, and we were all on the Long Island Railroad heading out to Island Media. 
we wrote all the lyrics on the spot in the train car and in the studio. And, you know, it was just, you know, really off the top of the head type stuff and all of the uh, ad libs and everything. And it just came together very organically. And, you know, boom, who knew we had a hit record, you know, at the time. And then you look at Doom being so young, you know, getting on that record and then like, like kind of like catapulting him into like the spotlight as a, as a very young kid. Right. And, you know, he had an incredible start. Uh, was this the uh, formation of KMD at the time or were we still talking about Get Yours Posse kind of coming into their own as KMD? No, K Doom already had formulated KMD as an existing, you know, group with, with him and Subrock and Jade One at that time. And then at some point, I think that Jade One, you know, they were also devout Muslims and involved with the Ansar community. And, you know, they were going to different, you know, uh, t teachings and, uh, you know, going into Brooklyn to headquarters and, you know, just proselytizing to all the different kids in the community that were down with them or were interested. And I think J1 left, and that's when they met Onyx. And then Onyx was just down, and then he wasn't really an MC at the time. But then from being around Doom, you know, he tried his hand out. It was nice. And then Doom put him down. So I, I even remember the point where – we even had contracts growing up, and J1 was on it. And then Doom said, well, we got this new kid, Onyx. And I remember he even said, no, he's down with us. And he even made sure, like, yo, if we ever get money, Doom, uh, you know, Onyx is getting, like, you know, half of what, you know, each of us are getting. And, you know, that's the way it just Onyx became the third member. And for Mr. Hood, you know, the rest is history. That was, that was how the group developed. And... Doom was on the road with us, you know, a lot of different places, a lot of different shows. And then we would sometimes take, uh, you know, Sub Rock with us as well. But that wasn't more till later, like, 91. Like, in 1990, it was mostly just Doom with us. Like, when we went on the Kane tour, we might have had KMD along for certain things, but it was mostly Doom because the other kids were in school. And it was like, you know, it was during the school year. So, you know, that was an interesting time. And then, like, later on, like, when their album came out, you know, that's where you see some of those pictures with, like, Doom, with Tupac, and with Sub Rock and DJ Fuse. That's probably a picture from, like, 91, 92 era, like, when they were on, like, with the Brand Nubian tours and stuff like that. Right. Uh, DJ Sub Rock doesn't get too much mention. Can you take me back to uh, your earlier thoughts of uh, Sub Rock? Yeah, well, you know, Sub was, you know, another musical genius. Now, originally, you know, and even Dante, you know, usually says this and backs it up, that Doom would get very creative as a producer, but wasn't, like, as fine-tuned technically. Like, you know, some people say, like, you look at, like, Africa Bambata, they'll mention, oh, like, Bam never knew how to really do all the actual, like, plugging in of everything and making sure the EQ and everything, but... Sub not only had the artistic vision, but he had a little bit more of the technical skills, you know, sonically to make shit sound right. And But they both kind of work like these weird, like, Siamese twins mentally and musically where they one would start a, uh, an idea and the other would finish it. So Sub Rock on that first record would really refine everything and bring it all together. And then little by little he started to come out of his shell as an MC too. And he started to write and, you know, and as you know, by the time Black Bastards was getting done, he was almost, they were almost like an MC duo at that time. Right. That's like a, and yeah, but, but he was the DJ as well. So like, so even some very early shows at third base did one of the, one of the earliest performances we did on the road that we took them on the road with us was in St. Louis for the Magic, I think Magic 108 or Magic 102, we did like a summer jam. And, uh, you know, Sub Rock was, was our DJ. Because I don't – Rich – Daddy Rich was not down with us yet. We had just lost uh, this guy, DJ White Knight. And it was in between. So I even have pictures where Sub, Sub is DJing for us. So that was like – and that, 
you know, that, that was like something that was transformational just in terms of like, you know, them being artists because all of a sudden they're in Long Beach, Doom's on the record, it's not a hit yet. I mean, it's a, Step Into AM is, this is when Step Into AM's only out. Gas Phase isn't even, I don't think, fully out yet, but we would still perform it because, you know, we had it in the repertoire. So Magic wants us to do two records. I think we do Gas Phase, Step Into AM. And after, you know, little girls are coming up to Doom asking for his autograph. We got pictures of Doom, like, signing his first autograph <laughs> ever. You know? so, check this out. So that was like, you know, they were just, like, so innocent and everything was so much fun at that point. And, like, you had Ahmed, Otis, Subrock, and Doom. Like, you know, just that whole crew from Long Beach, you know, going straight from the street on the corner, you know, to all over the country, you know. You know, just meeting people, just, you know, learning more about, you know, what's what's out there beyond Long Beach. Right. Uh, during the uh, recording process of the Cactus album, what part did uh, the guys play earlier on? And was it always a plan to feature those guys on that debut album? I just checked out. Someone asked a question if I had a Maserati when I was living in bed -Stuy. No, I never I never owned a Maserati. <laughs> <laughs> but I got sidetracked by that. So what was the question? Um, going into uh, that debut album, uh, what was that recording process like? And what uh, part did those guys play uh, earlier on? Uh, and was it always in the plans to feature Zev Love X on a track? Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, that came, Doom was always hanging out in the studio as well as Sub Rock bringing him along whenever they could. So, you know, we're recording with Sam Sever and Chung King. We're recording with the Bomb Squad in Green Street Studios where, you know, major hip-hop classics from Curtis Blow to Public Enemy have been recorded. And, you know, the Sub Rock and Doom are right in there with Keith Shockley with the, with the you know, the machines, SB12, everything. Like, yo, let's check it out. So we would let them kind of experiment, get loose on stuff. And that's at the point where we're mixing some of these records at Green Street. Like, we mix Gas Face and Brooklyn Queens at Green Street. So they spent a lot of time in the studio, you know, and, you know, we're getting acclimated and learning things. So by the time that Doom was on Gas Phase, you know, he had gone far, far enough with Sub Rock where we were, like, basically telling Russell and people at Def Jam about KMD, and obviously they knew about him because he's on a Def Jam record. But then, you know, Dante heard about them, and he really – he really loved them as well. So I don't even think it was like it was really too much of an offer anywhere. Dante had just started Electra, and he's like, yo, I really want them. And he came up with like a real substantial number for like a first group at that time. I think it was like $275,000 maybe. And, you know, me and Search formed Rift Productions. So that was the first production company for Mr. Hood. And then we even had a – a co-management agreement with Rush. So they would be managed by Rush as well. So, you know, you look at, I was looking at a picture that I found yesterday from the Gas Phase video. And, you know, you got Doom, DMC, Jam Master J, you know, and, you know, that that's that's what they were thrust into, you know, like, you know, the, the history of hip hop back from the early 80s to the old school, to like them being such young kids taking it into the next, you know, the next generation. Right. Because me and some kind of middle, we were already like 20, you know, they're like, you know, 15, 16, 17, maybe we were 21 at that point. And, you know, we had experienced a lot more than they had up at that point. We were kind of like in the business for a couple of years, but, you know, they learned quick and, you know, they, they were successful. You know, it wasn't like they, Listen, a lot of people don't realize back then it was so hard for a group to go gold. Like, you know, Tribe wasn't even gold for a certain amount of period. Like, right. like Tribe didn't go gold long stretch. Right. And it, it was very unusual for a new group to, you know, have hits and have a gold record. You could see them on Word Up everywhere. But, like, you know, when it came time to look at the sales, very few. So I think they sold, like, about 150 for Electra. So they – did enough damage that we got picked up for the second album and everything. So they were on their way. Uh, just to rewind a little bit, did those guys have an opportunity to shop a demo or was it always between a Def Jam Electra situation? Yeah, no, we, like I said, we really didn't shop it. It was like, 
just like Dante heard it or they were in the studio. It just happened really organically. And, like, I think we may, might have, like, went to, like, Russell maybe first. But, you know, Dante was way more aggressive and down to get them, you know, early on. Right. So the first deal was only for one album until they seen what uh, the uh, process, uh, how much they were going to sell? All the deals back then, like, Tommy Boy offered us for a full album, like, a $30,000 deal. Like, that's the type of deals that were going on in 87, 88. By the time, you know, 90, 91 came, you know, groups were getting much more substantial deals. But they were always deals that had an option to get picked up. So the, the label could always drop you after – you know, your, your next album. Right. So it was always just that option that was, you know, solely up to them. How do you think uh, life uh, changed for Zev Love X after getting the exposure with Gas Face? Oh, I mean, definitely, you know, first of all, he's totally recognizable in his own community in the hood. You know, he's like a local celebrity. But then at the same time, you have, you know, people maybe check a few, like, you know, hating on you because you're, you have the success. So he, he probably, I know he experienced some of that too, but I mean, overall, I mean, I think he relished it. I think he, you know, really enjoyed it. And it also gave him the platform to bring his little brother, you know, into that KMD unit and to promote what they really wanted to you know, they, listen. They had a, a clear plan as to what they wanted to do musically and with their message. Cause you know, the message wasn't just about, you know, you know, beats and rhymes. It was, you know, a much bigger message of, you know, Islam and about, you know, their philosophies and just the, uh, you know, positive cause in a much damaged society. It was much deeper than just, you know, party jams and, you know, per se hip hop, you know, right. happy go lucky shit. Even though Mr. Hood was a very playful record in some respects, you know, there was some deep shit on there too. But of course, they took it to the next level on Black Bass. Right. Uh, can you take me back to the uh, recording process of Mr. Hood? Uh, how long did it take the album? What were the sessions like? Can you uh, give us some exclusive details of what life was like recording that classic album? What happened was originally, like, Doom was always in Chung King with us, and obviously he was impressed by, you know, this is the place where Run DMC, LL, Beastie Boys, everyone, you know, recorded Dana Dane. They're, they're like gold, platinum albums. But when we got together with Dante and we were working out the budget, Dante had this little studio in like this West Beth part of Manhattan. And the SD50s had been formed with him, John Gamble, and Gibi. Now, rest in peace to Gibi and Gamble, who just passed in the past 12 months as well, along with Doom. And then you, so you look at all four of those figures that are no longer with us. I mean, that. That was like the core of the original production for Mr. Hood. So, you know, Subrock and Doom were in that studio just like nonstop. And I joked around with, uh, with Dante because when they finally got into Chung King to mix it, I would get all these invoices and bills from this company called the Toy Specialist that would have all sorts of EQs or other like samplers or, you know, synthesizers, drum machines. And, you know, always extra add-on costs, and they would, they would take a lot of time. Like, Doom was very much of a perfectionist with the sound that he wanted. And I know that I looked through a couple of past, like, articles and things, just, you know, just reminiscing the last couple of days. And, like, you know, Dante really got on gamble because Dante didn't like, says he didn't like the way that, the actual record sounded sonically. He thought that it could have been better, that it was a little dirty, but Doom wanted that that sound. Like he wanted it exactly the way that it was. You know, and like I've heard Dante say, and I agree with him, Subrock would a lot of times clean that up to get it to the point where, you know, a professional engineer or a record executive would listen to it and say it's there. Like Doom still wanted it to be, you know, St still like static, you know, like, you know, still sound like kind of like that. I mean, even look at his later stuff that he did, at, you know, post 2000. It's like his, his stick, you know, it's like his signature. Right. So there was a lot of time spent on that record. And, you know, when it got into Chung King, you know, everything came together and, you know, that album's a classic. So 
What do you think the guys took from uh, your recording sessions with the Cactus album and implemented uh, with their own debut album, if anything? And did you give them any advice uh, throughout this pr pr process? I mean, there was, you didn't really have to give – you could – I mean, I helped him uh, buy his, like, SP-12, uh, MPC-60, you know, stuff like that. Like, just putting stuff like that or giving him records or putting them up on this or that, you know, that was more like the influence there. They knew what they wanted to do. They didn't need any – you know, direction from us, you know, they had a clear sense of, you know, what they wanted to do when they were in the lab because they would do stuff in their in their room, you know, on 114 East Hudson in, uh, in Long Beach. You know, they had a very, you know, dedicated, you know, almost like otherworldly, like, connection with their music. Right. Uh, when they turned that album into the record company, what was the reaction from the uh, execs over there, Dante Ross, too? No, I mean, like I said, Dante was a little upset and got on gamble on how certain things sounded, like sonically, like, oh, this could have sounded better or cleaner, you know, but that was basically the main thing, you know, and, uh, you know, when Peach Fuzz came out, you know, with the video, like the Vid Kid, you know, did the video, like all the people that were, you know, like in our camp, you know, went on into the KMD camp and also worked with them. So we had, like, you know, a lot of, you know, between Rush, you know, even, like, with Bobito working at, at Def Jam, he knew them. Like, Bobito's in the Gas Space video with Doom, you know, and then, you know, it's like everybody was, you know, Doom was always up in the Def Jam office, always at the Rush office. So, right. you know, it was just that title, like, type of, like, family type thing. Uh, if I can remember right, the album dropped the same day as Ice T's original Gangsta and De La Soul's uh, uh, second album, De La Soul's Dead. Uh, did that have any effect on the sales, or was there any type of uh, plan dropping the same day as these guys, or was it not an issue? Now, back then, there was no – just that was pre the days of, like, focusing on a release. You know, that's like – and especially with the new artists. Like, you're trying to break the single before that. Then you get to that date and, you know, records were not selling at the, in the volumes to affect the chart the first couple of weeks, even if it was a hip hop record. Right. Um, and plus, don't forget at that time, there were a lot of bootlegs on the street. So every artist, if you were a popular hip hop act, you might have 25 to 100,000 cassettes, you know, not showing up on the sound scan or, or officially with the label because, you know, the bootleggers, Got him. I remember me and Serge did some specials with MTV and other outlets where we went out on the street in Canal Street and started fucking with people who were selling, you know, the fake third base tape. So, I mean, we, every, like, if you look at Tribe, De La, Us, whoever from that, you know, couple year period, I mean, we probably lost like 100,000, 150,000 just on the bootlegs. Right. I still got a bootleg. I, I kept one of, one of the Cactus album bootlegs that we, we grabbed off one of the tables. Right. Uh, when that album finally came out, uh, personally, what were you hearing uh, as far as the uh, hip hop community goes? What was the reaction when that album finally uh, was released? Which album, the, Mr. Hood? What was oh, what was the yeah, no, reaction? No, no, Mr. Hood was you know very well received. You know, and obviously you had the the formation of like the God Squad with Brand Nubian. And with KMD and also having leaders on, on Electra. So they were put out on promotional tours with them. And you know, that's where I said that picture with Tupac that, that surfaced out there. That's in that period where, you know, it was KMD out on the road with those guys. And they were learning a lot and just taking it to their – they were, like, coming into their own, like, doing their own thing, you know. And, you know, developing their stage show, the stage presence. Right. And I think that's where Doom also came more – you know, into his own. And that's where Sub Rock really shined. And also, they had like Jay Quest, the Boogeyman, the Dancers, you know, that whole crew. That was, that was a very, you know, animated crew that they had with them. And, you know, they, they really uh, made, a, made a mark for themselves. And, you know, but like I said, at the same time, they're devout Muslims. They're, they've got their message. And they're, you know, I think, I think before when they were going out with the road with us, they were much more um stringent like they weren't drinking or smoking or anything and then at some point you know teenagers you know adolescents you know they they started to partake actually and you know then just they are that developed into kind of like the attitude of black bastards 
Um, right after uh, Mr. Hood dropped, you guys dropped your sophomore album. Both of them turned 30 this year. Uh, what do you remember the most about collabing with them guys?